Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for the virtual Vertica BDC 2020. Today's breakout session is entitled The Shortest Path to Vertica, Best Practices for Data Warehouse Migration and ETL. I'm Jeff Healy. I lead Vertica Marketing. I'll be your host for this breakout session. Joining me today are Marco Gester and Mauricio Felici, Vertica Product Engineers, joining us from the EMEA region. But before we begin, I encourage you to submit questions or comments during the virtual session. You don't have to wait. Just type your question or comment in the question box below the slides and click Submit. As always, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We'll answer as many questions that we're able to during that time. Any questions we don't address, we'll do our best to answer them offline. Alternatively, visit Vertica Forums at forum.vertica.com to post your questions there after the session. Our engineering team is planning to join the forums to keep the conversation going. Also, a reminder that you can maximize your screen by clicking the double arrow button in the lower right corner of the slides. And yes, this virtual session is being recorded. It will be available to view on demand this week send you a notification as soon as it's ready. Now let's get started. Over to you, Mar Marco and Rizio. Hello, everybody. This is Marco speaking. Uh, I'm a sales engineer from EMEA, as Jeff said. Uh, I'll just get going. Uh, this is the agenda. Uh, part one will be done by me. Part two will be done by Maurizio. The agenda is, as you can see, Big Bang or piece by piece and then migration of the DDL, migration of the physical data model, migration of, ETI, of ETL and BI functionality, uh, what to do with stored procedures, what to do with any possible existing user-defined functions, and migration of the data. Part two will be by Maurizio. Do you want to talk about it, Maurizio? Shall I do it? Yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Maurizio Felici, and I'm a Vertica Corporate Presales like Marco. I'm going to talk about uh, how to optimize data warehouses using some specific Vertica techniques like table flattening and uh, live aggregate projections. So let me start with the a quick overview of the uh, data warehouse migration process we are going to talk about today. And uh, normally, we often suggest to start migrating the current data warehouse, the old data warehouse, as is, with limited or minimal changes in the data warehouse architecture. And uh, yeah, clearly, we will have to port the DDL uh, or to redirect the data access tool and the field platform, but we should minimize in the initial phase the amount of changes in order to go, go live uh, uh, as soon as possible. Uh, this is something that we also suggest. In the second phase, we can start optimizing the data warehouse and uh, with, again, with no or minimal changes in the architecture as such. Uh, and during this optimization phase, we can create, for example, ad hoc projections or uh, for some specific query or optimize the encoding or tune some of the resource pools. This is something that we normally do if and when needed. And finally, and again, if and when needed, we go through the architecture redesign for the data warehouses using uh, full uh, Vertica techniques in order to take advantage of all the features we have in Vertica. And this is normally an iterative approach, so we go back tuning some of the specific feature uh, before moving back to the architecture redesign. We are going through this process in the next few slides. Uh, okay. Instead, in order to encourage everyone to keep using their common sense when migrating to a new database management system, people are you often afraid of it, it's just often useful to use the analogy of a house move. In your old home, you might have developed solutions for your everyday life that make perfect sense there. For example, if your old St. Bernard dog can't walk anymore, you might be using a forklifter to heave him through your window in the old home. Well, in the new home, consider the elevator and don't complain that the window is too small to fit the dog through. 
Uh, this is very much in the same way as um, <clears throat> Maurizio was starting to make the transition gentle. Uh, again, I, I love to remain in my analogy with the house move. Picture your new house as your new holiday home. Begin to install everything you miss and everything you like from your old home. Once you have everything you need in your new house, you can shut down and sell the old one. So move piece by piece and go for quick wins to make your audience happy. You do Big Bang only if they are going to retire the platform you are sitting on. We are really on a sinking ship. Otherwise, again, identify quick wins, implement, publish them quickly in Vertica, reap the benefits, enjoy the applause, use the gained reputation for further funding. Uh, and if you find that nobody's using the old platform anymore, you can shut it down. If you really have to migrate, you can still go to really go to Big Bang in one go, only if you absolutely have to. Otherwise, migrate by subject area, user group, or similar clear divisions. Right. Having said that, uh, you start off by migrating objects. Objects in the database. That's one of the very first steps. It consists of migrating first to places where you can put the other objects into, that is, owners, locations, which is usually schemas. Then once you have that, you extract the tables, the views. Then uh, you convert the object definition, deploy them to Vertica, and think that you shouldn't do it manually never type what you can generate, automate whatever you can. Users and roles, usually there is a system table also in the old database that contains all the roles. You can export those to a file, reformat them, and then you have a create role and create user script that you can apply to Vertica. Uh, if LDAP Active Directory was used for the authentication in the old database, Vertica supports anything within the LDAP standard. Uh, catalogs and schemas should be relatively straightforward with maybe sometimes a difference. Vertica does not restrict you by defining a schema as a collection of all objects owned by a user. But it supports, it emulates it for all time's sake. Uh, Vertica does not need the catalog or if you absolutely need the catalog from the old tools that you use, it is usually set, it is always set to the name of the database in case of Vertica. Having had now the schemas, the catalogs, the users and roles in place, you move the data definition language of the existing tables of the sort. Uh, if you are allowed to, it's best to use a tool that translates the data types in the DDL generated. Uh, you might hear the mention of ODB, a tool written by Maurizio, by the way. Several times in this presentation, we are very happy to have it. Uh, it actually can export the old uh, database uh, table definitions because it, got, it works with ODBC. It gets what the old database ODBC driver translates to ODBC, and then it has internal translation tables to several target schema, uh, to several target DBMS flavors, the most important of which is obviously Vertica. Uh, if they force you to use something else, there are always tools like SQL Plus in Oracle, the show table, command in Teradata, etc. Each, each DBMS should have a set of tools to extract the object definitions to be deployed in the other instance of the same DBMS. Uh, if I talk about views, views usually have their view definition also in the old database catalog. Uh, one thing that you might uh, use, uh, use special, a bit of special care, synonyms, is something that Vertica emulates in different ways depending on the specific needs. A select star view on the view or table to be referred to 
or something that is really neat that other databases don't have, the search path in Vertica that works that works very much like the path environment variable in Windows or Linux, where you specify a table, an object name without the schema name, and then it searches it first in the first entry of the search path, then in the second, and then in the third, uh, which makes synonyms usually completely uh, unneeded. Uh, when you generate your DDL, uh, we remain in the analogy of moving house, dust and clean your stuff before placing it in the new house. If you see a table like the one here at the bottom, this is usually a corpse of a bad migration in the past already. Uh, an ID is usually an integer and not an almost floating point data type. A first name hardly ever has 256 characters. and the if it's called higher DT, it's not necessarily needed to store the second when somebody was hired. So take good care in using, while you are moving, dust off your stuff and use better data types. Uh, the same applies especially to string. How many bytes does a string contain that contains four euro signs? It's not four. It's actually 12 the euros in UTF-8 in the way that Vertica encodes strings. Uh, an ASCII character is one byte, but the euro sign takes three. And that means that you have to very often you have, when you have a single byte uh, character set at the source, you have to pay attention, oversize it first, because otherwise it gets rejected or truncated, and then uh, you, you will have to very carefully uh, check what their best size is. Uh, the best promising, the most promising approach is to initially dimension strings in multiples of their initial length. And again, ODB with the command you see there, with the minus i u two comma four, will double the length of what otherwise was a single byte character and multiply by four the length of uh, characters that are wide characters in traditional databases. And then load a representative sample of your source data and profile using the tools that uh, we personally use to find the actually longest data type and then make them shorter. Mauricio might be talking about the issues of having too long and too big data types. On projection design, uh, we live and die with our projections, you might know. Remember the rules on how default projections come to exist. Uh, the way that we do initially would be just like for the profiling, load a representative sample of the data, collect a representative set of already known queries from the Vertica database designer. Uh, and you don't have to decide immediately. You can always amend things and otherwise follow the laws of physics, uh, avoid moving data back and forth across nodes, avoid heavy IOs if you can design your, uh, your uh, projections initially by hand. Encoding matters. Uh, you know that the database designer is a very tight-fisted thing. It would optimize to use as little space as possible. You will have to think of the fact that if you compress very well, you might end up using more time in reading it. This is a test that Maurizio ran once using several encoding types. And you see that the RLE, the raw length encoded, if sorted, is not even visible, while the others are considerably slower. You can get those slides and look at, in, look at them in detail. I won't go in detail you now here about it. Uh, BI migrations move, usually you can expect 80% of everything to work, to be able to, li to be lifted and shifted. Uh, you don't need most of the pre-aggregated tables because we have live aggregate projections. Uh, many BI tools have specialized query objects for uh, the dimensions and the facts, and we have the, the possibility to use flattened tables that are 
going to be talked about later, you might have to write those by hand. You will be able to switch off caching because Vertica speeds up everything with uh, labs, uh, live aggregate projections. And you have worked with MOLAB cubes before, you, you very probably won't need them at all. ETL tools, what you will have to do uh, is, if you do it row by row in the old database, consider changing everything to very big transactions. And if you use insert statements with parameter markets, consider writing to named pipes and using Vertica's copy command. Mass inserts, yeah, copy command, that's what I have here. Uh, as to uh, custom functionality, you can see on this slide that Vertica has the biggest number of functions in the database. We compare them regularly by far compared to any other database. You might find that many of them that you have written won't be needed on the new database. So look at the Vertica catalog instead of trying to, uh, to migrate a function that you don't need. Um, stored procedures are very often used in the old database to overcome their shortcomings that Vertica doesn't have. Very rarely you will have to actually write a procedure that involves a loop. But it's really, in our experience, very, very rarely. Uh, usually you can just switch to standard scripting. And this is basically repeating what Maurizio said. In the interest of time, uh, I will skip this, look at this one here. Uh, the, most of the database, data warehouse migration tasks should be automatic. You can, use, you can automate DDL migration using ODB, which is crucial. Data profiling, it's not crucial, but game changing. The encoding is the same thing. You can automate it using our database designer. The t physical data model optimization in general is game changing. You have the database designer. Use the provisioning. Use the old platforms tools to generate the SQL. You have no objects without their owners. This is crucial. And as to functions and procedures, they are only crucial if they depict the company's intellectual property, otherwise you can almost always replace them with something else. That's it from me for now. Thanks for uh, your time. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Marco. So we will now continue our presentation talking about some of the Vertica data warehouse optimization techniques that we can implement in order to uh, improve the general efficiency of the uh, data warehouse. And let me start with a few uh, uh, simple messages. Well, the first one is that you are supposed to optimize only if and when this is needed. In most of the cases, just a lift and shift from the old data warehouse to Bertka will provide you exactly the performances you were looking for or even better. So in this case, probably is not really needed to to optimize anything. Um, in case you want to optimize or you need to optimize, then keep in mind some of the Vertica peculiarities. For example, implement, delete, and update in, uh, in, in the Vertica uh, way. Use live aggregate projections in order to avoid, or better, in order to limit the group by executions at the runtime. time. Use table flattening in order to avoid or limit joins. And, uh, and then you can also implement in Vertica some specific uh, Vertica extensions like, for example, time series analysis or machine learning on top of your data. Um, we will now start by reviewing the first of these bullets, optimize if and when needed. Well. If this is OK, I mean, if you get when you migrate from the old data warehouse to Vertica without uh, any optimization, if the performance level is OK, then probably you don't need to optimize anything. Uh, but uh, if this is not the case, one very easy optimization, optimization technique that you 
can ask is to ask Vertica itself to optimize the physical data model uh, using the Vertica database designer. How? Well, uh, DBD, which is uh, the Vertica database designer, has several interfaces. Uh, here I'm going to use what we call the DBD programmatic API, so basically SQL functions. And um, using other databases, you might need to hire experts looking at your data, your data browser, your table definition, creating indexes or whatever. In Vertica, all you need is to run something like this, as simple as six single uh, SQL statement to get a very well optimized physical data model. You see that we start creating a new design, then we add to these new design tables and queries, the queries that we want to optimize. We set our target. In this case, we are uh, tuning the physical data model in order to maximize query performances. This is why we are using my design query in, in, uh, um, in our uh, statement. Another possible alternative would be to tune in order to reduce storage, or a mix between tuning storage and tuning queries. And finally, we ask Vertica to produce and deploy this optimized design. It's a matter of, literally, it's a matter of minutes. And in a few minutes, what you can get is a fully optimized physical data model. Okay? This is something very, very easy to implement. Uh, keep in mind some of the Vertica peculiarities. Uh, Vertica is very well tuned for load and query operations. On Vertica Bright, a ROS container to disk, a file, if a ROS container is a group of files, uh, we will never, ever change the content of this file. The fact that the ROS container files are never modified is one of the vertical peculiarities. And this approach let us to use uh, minimal locks. Uh, we can have multiple load operations in parallel against the very same table, assuming we don't have a primary or unique constraint on the target table in parallel, as I said, because they will end up into different ROS containers. Uh, select in read committed requires no lock at all and can run concurrently with insert select because the select will work on a snapshot of the catalog when the transaction starts. Uh, this is what we call snapshot isolation. Uh, backup and recovery, because we never change our ROS files, are very simple and robust. Uh, so we have a huge amount of advantages um, due to the fact that we never change the content of the ROS uh, files contain in the ROS containers. But on the other side, uh, deletes and updates require a little attention. Uh, so what about delete? First, when you delete in Vertica, you basically create a new object, a delete vector. It could be either a, a delete vector in the ROS or in memory. And uh, this uh, delete vector will point to the data being deleted, so that when the query is executed, Vertica will just ignore the rows listed in the delete vectors. And uh, uh, it's not just about delete. An update in Vertica consists of two operations, delete and insert. Merge consists of either insert or update, which in turn is made of delete and insert. So basically, if we tune how the delete work, we will also have tuned the update and the merge. Uh, so what should we do in order to optimize delete? Well, remember what we said, that every time we delete, um, actually, we create a new object, a delete vector. So avoid committing delete and update too often will reduce uh, work, the work for the merge out, for the top mover merge out activities that are run afterwards. And uh, be sure that all the interested projections will contain the column views in the delete predicate. 
this will let Vertica to directly access the projection without having to go through the super projection in order to create the delete vector, and the delete will be much, much faster. And finally, uh, another very interesting optimization technique is trying to segregate the update and delete operation from query and insert workload in order to reduce log contention. This is something we are going to discuss on this um, obtained using a partition, uh, partition operation. This is exactly what I want to talk about now. Uh, here you have a typical uh, data warehouse uh, architecture, so we have data uh, arriving in a landing zone where the data is loaded as it is from the data sources, then we have a transformation layer writing into a staging area that in turn will feed the partitions block of data. Uh, in the green data structure we have at the end, those green data structure we have at the end are the ones used by the data access tools uh, when they run their queries. Uh, sometimes we might need to change old data, uh, for example, because we have late records or maybe because we want to fix uh, some errors that have been originated in the data sources. So what we do in these cases, we just copy back the partition we want to change or we want to adjust from the green area at the end to the staging area. We have a very fast operation, which is copy partition. Then uh, we run our um, updates or our uh, adjustment procedure or whatever we need in order to fix the errors in the data in the staging area. And at the very same time, people continue to use the green uh, data structures that are at the end. Uh, so we will never have contention between the two operations. When the update in the staging area is completed, what we have to do is just to run a swap partition between tables in order to swap the data that we just finished to adjust in the staging uh, zone uh, to the query area that is the green one at the end. This swap partition is very fast, is an atomic operation, and basically what happens is just uh, that we exchange uh, the pointer to the data. This is a very, very effective technique, and a lot of customers use this. So why flatten table and live aggregate projections? Uh, well, Basically, we use flattened table and live aggregate projection to minimize or avoid joins, and this is what flattened table are used for, or group by, and this is what live aggregate projections are used for. Now, compared to traditional data warehouses, Vertica can store and process and aggregate and join order of magnitudes more data. That is a true columnar database, joints and group by normally are not a problem at all. They run faster than any traditional data warehouse. That said, there are still scenarios where data sets are so big, and we are talking about petabytes of data, and so quickly growing that we need something in order to boost group by and join performances. And this is why Vertica can introduce live aggregate projections to perform aggregations at loading time and limit the need for group buys at query on time, and flatten tables to combine information from different entity at loading time and again avoid running joints at query run time. Okay? So live aggregate projections. Uh, at this point in time, uh, we can uh, use live aggregate projections using four built-in aggregate functions, which are sum, min, max, and count. Okay? Let's see how this works. Suppose that you have uh, a normal table. In this case, we have a table unit sold with 
three columns, PID, date, time, and quantity, which has been uh, segmented in a given way. Uh, and on top of this base table, we call it anchor table, we create a projection. You see that we create the projection using the select that will aggregate the data. We get the PID, we get the date portion of date time, and we get the sum of quantity from, um, from the base table, grouping on the first two columns, so PID and the date portion of date time. Okay? Uh, what happens in this case? When we load data into the base table, all we have to do is to load data into the base table. When we load data into the base table, we will fill, of course, the projections that, assuming we are running with K51, we will have uh, two, projection, uh, two projections, and we will load the data into those two projections with all the detailed data we are going to load into the table, so PID, date time, and quantity. But at the very same time, at the very same time, and without having to do nothing, any, any particular operation, or without having to run any, any uh, ETL procedure, we will also get automatically in the live aggregate projection uh, the data pre-aggregated with PID, the date portion of date time, and the sum of quantity into the table name uh, total quantity. You see, it's something that we get for free without having to run any uh, specific procedure. And this is very, very efficient. So the key concept is that during the loading operation, from the ETL point of view, is executed again the, 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 the base table. We do not explicitly aggregate data, or we don't run any, any ETL procedure. The aggregation is automatic and will bring the data to the live aggregate projection every time we load into the base table. You see the two selects that we have, we have on, uh, in this slide on the uh, left side. And uh, you see that those two selects will produce exactly the same result. So running select PID date time some quantity from the base table or running a select star from the uh, live aggregate projection will result exactly in the same data in output. This is, uh, of course, very useful, but is much more useful the fact that if we, uh, uh, and we can ob observe this if we run and explain, uh, if we run the select against the base table asking for this group data, what happens behind the scene is that basically Vertica itself recognizes that there is a live aggregate projection with the data that has been already aggregated during the loading phase and rewrites your query using the live aggregate projection. This happens automatically. You see, this is a query that run a group by against unit sold, and Vertica decided to rewrite this query as something that has to be collected against the live aggregate projection because it already exists. This will save a huge amount of time and effort during the ETL cycle. Okay? Uh, and it's not just limited to the uh, information you want to aggregate. Uh, for example, another query like select count distinct. You, you, you might know that count distinct basically is a group by. Uh, we'll also take advantage of the live aggregate projection. And again, this is something that happens automatically. Uh, you don't have to do anything to get this. Okay? Um, one thing that we have to keep very, very clear in mind, Vertica, what we, what we store in the live aggregate projection are uh, uh, basically partially aggregated data. So um, in this example, we have two inserts, 
Okay, you see that we have the first insert that is inserted in four rows, and the second insert, uh, which is inserting five rows. Well, in for each of these inserts, we will have a partial aggregation. You, 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 you will never know that after the first insert you will have a second one. So BESCA will calculate the aggregation of the data every time you run the insert. This is a, a, a key concept. Uh, and this also means that you can maximize the effectiveness of this technique by inserting large chunk of data. Okay? If you insert data row by row, this technique, live aggregate projection, is not very useful because for every row that you insert, you will have uh, an aggregation. So basically, the live aggregate projection will end up containing the same number of rows that you have in the base table. Uh, but if you every time insert a large chunk of data, the number of the uh, aggregations that you will have in the live aggregate projection is much less than the base data. So this is, uh, this is a key concept. Um, you can see how this works um, um, by counting the number of rows that you have in the live aggregate projection. Uh, you see that if you run the select count star from the solved live aggregate projection, the query on the left side, you will get four rows. But actually, if you explain this query, you will see that he was reading six rows. So this was because every of those two inserts that we ran previously uh, inserted a few rows in uh, three rows in the in the in the live aggregate projection. So this is a key concept: live aggregate projection keeps partially aggregated data. The final aggregation will always happen at right time. Okay. Another uh, which is very similar to the uh, live aggregate projection are what we call top K projection. We actually do not aggregate anything in the top K projection. We just uh, keep uh, the last uh, or limit the amount of rows that we collect using the limit over partition by order by close. And this, again, uh, in this case, we create on top of the base table two uh, top K projection, uh, one to keep the last quantity that has been sold, and the other one to keep the max quantity. In both cases, it's just a matter of ordering the data uh, in the first case using the D time column, in the second case using quantity. Uh, in both cases, we fill projection with just the last rows. And again, this is something that we do uh, when we insert data into the base table. And this is something that happens automatically. Okay? Uh, if we now run uh, after the insert our select against either the max quantity top K or the last quantity top K, we will get the very last data. And you see that we have much less rows in the um, top K projections. OK. We told at the beginning that basically we can use four built-in functions. You might remember mean, max, sum, and count. Uh, what if I want to create my own specific aggregation uh, on top of the data? And customers, some of the customers, our customers have very uh, specific needs in terms of uh, live aggregate projections. Well, in this case, you can code your own live aggregate projection user-defined functions. So you can create the user-defined transfer function to implement any sort of complex uh, aggregation uh, while loading data. Basically, uh, after you implemented this UDTF, you can uh, deploy using either the pre-pass approach. That basically means that data is aggregated at loading time during the data ingestion, or the 
uh, batch approach. That means that the data is aggregated when uh, the tool mover is uh, running on top of it. Uh, things to remember on live aggregate projections, um, they are limited to the uh, built-in function, again, sum, mum, max, min, and count, uh, but you can code your own uh, UDTF, so you, you can do whatever you want. They can reference only one table, and uh, for that uh, version before 9.3, it was impossible to update or delete uh, on the anchor table. This limit has been removed in 9.3. So you now can update and delete data from the anchor table, OK? Um, live aggregate projection will follow the segmentation of the group by expression. And in some cases, the vertical optimizer can decide to pick the live aggregate projection or not, depending on the uh, it, depending on the fact that the aggregation is uh, uh, consistent or not. Remember that if we insert and commit every single row into the anchor table, then we will end up with a live aggregate projection that contains exactly the same number of rows. In this case, using LAP or using the base table uh, is, uh, would be the same. Okay? So this is one of the two uh, fantastic techniques that we can implement in uh, Vertica. Um, this live aggregate projection is basically to avoid or limit group bias. The other, uh, which we are going to talk about, is flattened table, and this is used in order to um, avoid uh, the needs for joints. Uh, remember, Vertica is very fast running joints, but when we scale up to petabytes of data, we need to boost. Uh, and this is uh, what we uh, have in order to have this um, problem fixed, regardless of the amount of data we are dealing with. Um, so how, uh, what about flattened table? Let me start with normalized schemas. Everybody knows what is a normalized schema. There is no vertical related stuff in this slide. Uh, the main scope of a uh, normalized schema uh, is to reduce data redundancies. So uh, and the fact that we reduce data redundancies uh, is, uh, is, a, is a good thing because we will obtain um, fast and small writes. We will have to write into a database small chunks of data into the right table. The problem with these normalized schemas is that when you run your queries, you have to put together the information that arrives from different tables, and this requires to run joints. Uh, again, joints is, vertical normally is very good to, to, to run joints, but sometimes uh, the amount of data uh, makes uh, not easy to uh, deal with joints, and uh, joints sometimes are uh, not easy to, to tune. Uh, uh, what happens uh, in, uh, in the normal, let's say, traditional data browse is that we uh, denormalize the schemas uh, uh, normally, either manually or, or using an ETL. So basically, we have on one side, in this slide, on the uh, left side, the normalized schemas where we can get very fast writes. Uh, on the other side, on the left, we have the wider table where we run all the pre-joins and pre-aggregation in order to prepare the data for the queries. And so we will have fast writes on the left, fast reads on the left, uh, sorry, fast writes on, on, on the right, and fast read on the left side of these slides. The problem is in the middle, because we will push all the complexity in the middle in the ETL that will have to transform the normalized schema into the wider table. And the way we normally implement this, uh, uh, either manually using procedures that we coded or using ETL, 
uh, this is what happens in traditional data warehouse, is that uh, we will have to code an ETL layer uh, in order to run the um, insert select that will read from the normalized schema and write into the uh, wider table at the end, the one that is used by the data access tools. We we are going to um, to to use to to run our queries. Uh, so this approach is costly because, of course, someone will have to code this ETL. And it is slow because someone will have to execute those batches normally overnight after loading the data. And maybe someone will have to check the following morning that everything was OK with the batch. And is resource intensive, of course, and is also human being intensive because of the people that will have to code and check the results. Is error prone because it can fail. And introduce a latency because there is a gap in the time axis between the time T0 when you load the data into the normalized schema and the time T1 when you get the data finally ready to be, to be queried. So what we did in Vertica to facilitate this process is to create this flattened table. With the flattened table, first, you avoid data redundancy because you don't need the white table uh, on the normalized schema on, on, um, on the left side. Uh, second, it's fully automatic. You don't have to do anything. You just have to insert the data into the wider table and the ETL uh, that you have coded is transformed into an insert select by Vertica automatically. You don't have to do anything. Uh, it's robust. And this latency zero is extremely fast. As soon as you load the data into the wider table, you will get all the joints executed for you. So uh, let's have a look on how it works. Uh, in this case, uh, we have um, the table we are going to flatten. And basically, uh, we have to focus on two different clauses. Uh, the first one is, you see that there is one table here, uh, dimension value 1, uh, which can be defined as default and then the select, or set using. Okay? The difference between default and set using is when the data is populated. If we use default, data is populated as soon as we load the data into the base table. If we use set using, we will have to refresh. But uh, everything is there. I mean, you don't need any TL. You don't need to code any transformation, because everything is in the table definition itself. And it's for free. And of course, is latency zero. So as soon as you load the other columns, you will have the dimension value uh, valued as well. OK? Uh, let's see an example here. Uh, um, suppose here we have a, a dimension table, uh, customer dimension that is on the left side. And we have a fact table on, uh, uh, on the right. You see that the fact table uses columns like O underscore name or O underscore city, which are basically the result of a select on top of the customer dimension. So this is where the join is executed. As soon as I load data into the uh, fact table, directly into the fact table, without, of course, loading the data that arrives from the dimension, all the data from the dimension will be populated automatically. So let's have an example here. Suppose that we are running this insert. As you can see, we are running the insert directly into the fact table, and we are loading OID, customer ID, and total. We are not loading neither, uh, uh, neither name nor city, those name and city will be automatically populated by Vertica for you because of the definition of the flat table. Okay? You see, this is uh, all you need in order to have your wider table 
built for you, your flattened table. And this means that at front time, you won't need any join between this fact table and the customer dimension that we uh, have used in order to populate name and city, because the data is already there. Uh, this was using default. Uh, the other option was is using set using. Uh, the concept is absolutely the same. You see that in this case, on the um, uh, on the right side, we have um, we have basically replaced the o underscore name uh, default with o underscore name set using, and same is true for city. Uh, the concept, as I said, is the same, uh, but in this case, if we use set using, then uh, we will have to refresh. You see that we have to run these select refresh columns and then the name of the table. Uh, in this case, all columns will be refreshed, or you can specify only certain columns. And this will bring the values for name and city reading from the uh, customer dimension. So, this technique, um, this technique is extremely useful. Um, the difference between default and set using, just to summarize uh, the most important difference, remember, you just have to remember that default will populate your target when you load, uh, set using when you refresh. And, and in some cases, you might need to use them both. So in some cases, you might want to use both default and set using. Uh, in this example here, you see that we define the O underscore name using both default and set using. And this means that we will have the data populated um, either when we load the data into the base table or when we run the uh, refresh. Uh, this is the summary of the uh, technique that we can implement in uh, Vertica in order to make our data warehouses even more efficient. And uh, well, basically, this is the end of our presentation. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, and now we are ready for the uh, Q&A session.